Amen. Good morning, everyone. So as you know, we've been in the series about discipleship. And so we are still there. I believe God has a word for restoration. I believe God is calling us to discipleship. Amen. And, and what I told the first service was this. If you're saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, you're a disciple. Amen. And so we, we're um, here to learn and see what God has to say about making disciples. So repeat after me. It takes one to make one. It takes one to make one. Yeah, I'm talking about discipleship. Can I get my um, big idea on the screen? Hey, there it is on the three screens. Amen. So it takes one to make one, radical discipleship. And DJ just read the scripture from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. And the big idea is this. Discipleship is seeking to imitate Christ. Somebody say, imitate Christ. And intentionally submitting to a lifestyle of serving as an example to others. Say, example to others. Imitate Christ and be an example to others. Oh, let's say that again. Imitate Christ and be an example to others. Yeah, discipleship, radical discipleship. It takes one to make one. So yesterday I was uh, cleaning my house. Well, just cleaning my living room. I didn't clean the whole house. <laughs> I was cleaning the living room and dusting off furniture. And I have this, um, this duck, duck and little duckling set that I acquired from my mom when she passed. And so I was dusting it off, and I'm looking, and I was putting it back, and, and the mama duck, she's like looking back, and then there's the little ducklings behind her looking up. And it just struck me when I thought about discipleship, right? Here's the mama duck, and here's the little ducklings following behind her. So... I went online and I said, there's something to this. I just know it. And, and I see, you know, and I was looking at the little videos of the little ducklings, you know, going behind Mama Duck. And it was so cute. But here's what I learned. I learned that when ducklings are born, a few hours after they're born, they will attach to an object that is moving or is large and is large, a large object moving object whether it's a living object or an in or, or an unliving object I don't even know how to say the word y'all inanimate so it could be a, a ball that's moving it will attach and follow that object of course most of the time they're around their mamas but they can follow humans d depending on who they see when they're first born within the first few hours. And that process is called imprinting, imprinting. And so when a duckling imprints, says the scientists, and I don't know how they know, but they said that ducks think they're that thing that they're following. So I guess if they follow in a ball, they think they're a ball, right? but they following a duck, they think they, they're a duck. So I, I thought that was quite interesting. And, and then when you look at discipleship, what that means is to follow or to be a follower or a learner. So if the little ducklings, everywhere mama go, little ducklings go, right? If mama go in the water, they go in the water. If she... I don't even know if she ran off a cliff, if they go behind her, uh, they might because they follow her just that close. They're attached to her. So then I begin to do my study on discipleship. 
And what I learned about that term discipler is not necessarily a Christian term. We know of it because we think of Christ and his disciples. And we know when Christ called his 12, he said to them, follow me. Follow me like the little ducklings. And so what a discipler will do is attach themselves to a person or a teacher or, a, or even a parent to learn from them. Some other words used for a discipler would be an apprentice. They would learn a trade or a student learning from a teacher or learning their philosophy. And back then, what disciples did was they would leave their homes and move in with their teacher or apprenticeship person or whoever and live with them to learn. So a follower. And so today what we're going to do is look at this body of believers from Thessalonica and they have exemplified discipleship. And, and, and it's exciting to, to hear and see what it is that they're going to show us today about discipleships. It takes one to make one. And so let's see what was going on um, leading up to our passage and the, the book of Thessalonia is actually a letter written by Paul, and, and some of his missionary friends were also included, Silas and Timothy. Remember Silas and remember Timothy. So Paul is writing this letter, and they, he calls it a letter of thanksgiving because he's commending these believers for their faith and, how, and what they're doing and how they're hanging in there and holding out. And so before... Um, when Paul founded the church, and this is for my IBS class, we're talking about history, guys. Okay, so I'm going to give a little history. We talked about um, literary context, so I'm going to give a little literary context. Amen. Um, so what happened was Paul was on his second um, missionary journey, and he had been in the town of Philippi, and he ended up going to prison, being beaten and going to prison, him, him and Silas. You remember hearing about Paul and Silas in prison, and remember um, they began to sing that night in prison, and, the, and an earthquake came and shook the chains loose, and we sing songs about it. Remember that, guys? Right after they were let out of prison, then Paul ended up in Thessalonica. Now, how he got there was that he had had a dream, and there was a man telling him to come to Macedonia, and, and Thessalonian, Thessalonia is a city in Macedonia. So here he is in Thessalonica, and he um, get, delivered the word of God, and the church grew by leaps and bounds. So many people gave their lives. No wonder that dream was beckoning him. It was a call from the Holy Spirit beckoning him to that town. So he gets there. The church is growing and flourishing, and he stays for a while to disciple them. But as luck would have it, some of those um, Jews that were mad at Paul, they come and they, they um, ran him out of the city. And he went to another city called Berea, and they ran him from there, and he went to Athens. But the whole time he's thinking about this church. So he sends Timothy back to check on the church. Timothy comes back with a good report because they're doing good, and hence the letter. So now Paul's writing the letter saying, I got a good report from Timothy, and he's commending them. And, and, and Timothy also brought a question they had. They were concerned because they believed that Christ was going to return within their lifetime, and some of their family members were dying, so they were concerned about that. So Paul addresses that in the letter, letting them know that when Christ comes back, the dead in Christ will rise, and those that are alive and remain man will be caught up to meet him in the sky. Y'all remember that passage? Amen. All right, so now I'm out of breath trying to help my class. <laughs> Amen. So uh, inductive Bible study class in case you guys want to take, take it next year. <laughs> Anyhow, so that was some background, some history, some literary context about the passage. So 
The purpose of the letter was to strengthen the Thessalonian Christians in their faith and to give them assurance of Christ's return. Now let's go back to the passage. Hopefully you've kept your Bibles open or on. And let's look at verse 4 and 5. Great, it's up there. Okay. Verses 4 and 5, it says this. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your name's sake. And so my point would be this. A disciple is recognized by their lifestyle. A disciple is recognized by their lifestyle. A disciple walks their talk. A disciple walks their talk. What does that mean? A changed life, a changed behavior. So this is Paul telling them, I, I, I know, we know that you're loved by God. He has chosen you. Why? Because the gospel came to you, not simply with words, but with power and with the Holy Spirit. And when in reading this verse, what I noticed was there was uh, two no's, K-N-O-W-S. And you know, y'all know I love words. And so what that means, it means, it, it means to see. It means to observe externally. It means to perceive based on external observation. It means to notice or to discern. So here Paul is telling them, I've noticed, I've seen your behavior change. You're no longer the same. And, and then the church likewise, because he later says in verse 5, and you know how we lived, that, that they also observed and seen how Paul lived. And so a discipler is recognized by their lifestyle. A true character is revealed by our lives, right? Amen? And so being filled with the Holy Spirit, it causes us to do supernatural things. It causes the Holy Spirit, he causes us to act differently. He causes our behaviors to change. And and so likewise, when, when the word was given to them supernaturally, they received it supernaturally. Hallelujah, God must have loved them. And Paul said, God chose you and he loved you. He had a purpose for them. So that word chose, it also means elected. God chose and elected them for himself. Why? Because of his love. Why? Because he is love and he had a purpose, like I said, or a task. Remember in the New Testament, God chose Israel. He chose them to carry out his plan of redemption. And then God elected his own self, Jesus Christ, to come down and put on humankind and be the plan of redemption. And so that word chose and elected, it means something that God is is, is trying to get over a plan. And so he chose 12. Jesus chose the 12 to disciple. And then they turned the world upside down. And then God elected Paul to be an apostle for the Gentiles. And then God chooses you and God chooses me. And, and he wants us to go and make disciples. And he wants us to deliver his message to a dying world. A disciple is recognized by their lifestyle. They walk their talk. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask a question, and then I'm going to pause because I want you to think. Are we living a lifestyle we expect others to live? How about this? Would we be satisfied if those we lead to Christ become like us. Yeah. Uh, let, let's look back at the ducks for a minute. Let's look back at the ducks. There, there's this thing called the duck test. And, and when I said you're going to, you would have heard of it before. 
It says, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, quacks like a duck, then it probably is a duck, right? That's the duck test. And what the duck test does, it helps us to identify uh, someone's behavior by observation. Are you a duck? <laughs> Are you a duck? Are you a disciple? Huh? If it looks like a disciple, if it walks like a disciple, if it acts like a disciple, right? Then it must be a disciple. Yeah, they walk their talk. I have a, a co-worker that I've been working with, I would say a total of about 25 years, and we worked for two different companies. And um, I was telling the first service, between the two of us, we done had three husbands, at least I've had one, so that was her, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> but we've, we've worked together for so long and we've known each other for so long that, you know, we know each other. And so sometimes we sit around and we reminisce. And she calls me Brownie. So she'll say, Brownie, remember when you used to do this? And Brownie, remember when you used to do that and this and that? And, and it wasn't all holy, y'all. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. And actually, sometimes some of the things she reminds me of, I'm like, oh, my God, that was so embarrassing. And what was even worse was I was claiming the name of Christ at that time. Amen. Was I walking my talk? Probably not. But praise be to God for transformation. Praise be to God for deliverance. Praise be to God that he changes us and he turns us around. And so I'm not perfect. I haven't reached perfection. I still have faults, but I'm no longer that brownie that she remembers. Amen. When she comes to me with her problems and situations, I now give her godly advice. I pray for her. I, I, I give her encouraging words. I'm not the same person. Amen. My behavior has began to change. And why? Because as a disciple, it is my role to imitate Christ and to be an example of the faith to others. Amen. It takes one to make one. That takes me to my second point. Verses 6 through 7. <clears throat> I'll begin to read. It says, you, talking about Thessalonian, you became imitators of us, Paul and his missionaries. So you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. We see him again in this verse. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Imitate, model, example. So my second point is a disciple's role is to imitate Christ and therefore become an example of the faith for others. Amen? Yes, it takes one to, to make one. Discipleship is seeking to imitate Christ and intentionally submitting a lifestyle of serving as an example for others. So let's look at the first word there, imitator. I'm not going to try to pronounce the Greek word, so I'll let you try to guess what it is. But whatever it is, <laughs> this is what it means. It means follower or one who follows. Doesn't that sound familiar? Discipleship means the same thing, a follower. So to imitate means one who follows. It basically means to copy or imitate someone's
behavior. Now, from that Greek word come some other English words, mime, pantomime, and a word maybe half of y'all ain't going to know, mimeograph. Y'all know? Y'all heard of that? It's a copier. Lisa said, yeah, <laughs> we're the same age. <laughs> mimeograph, a copier. Man, I saw that. I got, I got hyped because all I could think of is that Christ is the original and we're the copies. Amen. <laughs> yeah, so, so as a, it's a disciple's role to imitate, to mimic is another word, Christ. So if we imitate Christ, if we mimic Christ, then guess what? Our behavior will begin to change. That's the key to discipleship, a changed behavior. So I have a, a, my baby grand, granddaughter, the baby. She's like 15 months old. Her name is Nova, and she's so cute. Of course, right? She's so cute. So uh, my son wants her to call me Mima versus Grandma. I'll take that, but my other granddaughter's called my grandma, so I don't know what's going to happen when they get together. So anyhow, he called me. They sent me a video the other day, and they told her, say Mima. And she said, Mima, and that just melted my heart. And then they FaceTimed me, and she was like, hi, Mima. And I said, I'm going to give you a million dollars. You know, because it just made me feel good. But she's mimicking her mother and her father, that, th those that are closest to her. And so when I offered her the million dollars, because it made my day that she called out my name, then I thought about God, how he would be so excited and happy when we mimic his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. When, when we say what he says and does what he does and walks like he walks, I imagine God is saying, I'm going to give you so many blessings that you won't have room enough to receive it. So it's a disciple's role to imitate, mimic, copy Christ. And here's what happens when we begin to do that then we become an example of the faith to others. So let's look at those words, example and model. Now that Greek word, I know that one, it says it's tupos. And like I said, told first service, I didn't say Tupac because he did. Tupos, okay? Sounds the same. That's probably why I can remember it. But tupos. Now, this word is very interesting. The meaning is very interesting, considering it's, it's an example and it's a model. Here's what it means. It's a mark of a blow. A mark of a blow, a stamp, making an impact, a strike, impress, a visible mark, a pattern, a mold. Keep in mind, um, all I could think of is jello mold. When you make jello and you put a mold on it, the jello looks like the mold. Okay? So when we imitate Christ, he puts his mold or his imprint on us and we begin to look more like him. We become an example, we become a model. Okay, so, so the, the Thessalonian church saw the stamp of Christ on Paul. And, and, and that caused them to turn their lives over to Christ. Amen. And, and another example that, that I forgot to, to say this morning that Christ gave in John 5 and 19, Christ's example, Christ's mold, he said he does only what the Father does. Right? And then he also said in John 14 and 9, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He has a mold, the stamp. When I was young, um, well, growing up, when I grew up, we didn't have to worry about gangs. We just had to worry about families. 
right? There was always that family in the neighborhood that beat up everybody, right? Y'all know, I bet y'all remember just who that family was, <laughs> okay? So we had that too in my neighborhood. Uh, and so we all, my brothers and my sister and I, all had bicycles, and my dad would tell us not to ride each other or anyone on our bikes. So I'm riding along one day, and here come a person from that family. And she was like, Karen, give me a ride. So I was scared of her, I'll admit. And I think I was more scared of her than daddy. So I told her, okay, but she wanted to ride me on my bike on the handlebars. So dumb me, I get on the handlebars and we're riding up 23rd headed toward Quebec. Okay, and so all of a sudden I could hear somebody laughing from like blocks away. She done jumped off the bike, left me on the handlebars, headed toward Quebec. Well, thank God, praise be to God, the bicycle lost control and I fell before I got to Quebec. But when I fell, I, I got a, a, a two-pass, a mark on my arm. Amen. And here's the key. It's still there. You see, it didn't fade. And one thing about Christ, when we imitate him and he puts a mark and a mold on us, it doesn't go anywhere. It stays there. When we as disciples are, are stamping and marking and imprinting the world or the people that we touch, the mark, it stays there. It doesn't fade. It's a reminder. It's a reminder of what happened. I can look at my elbow and I remember exactly. I can still hear her laughing. <laughs> a tupas. A disciple's role is to imitate Christ and become an example, a tupas of the faith for others. And so, guys, you and I, you and I, we have to mimic our disciplers and mimic our Christ. And then we must proclaim the faith that we have in word and in our life so that others might see Christ. We have to leave a mark. We have to leave a mark. It takes one to make one. So back to them ducks. <laughs> back to the ducks. So here's another interesting thing I learned. The ducks follow their mama, right? But it's only for about 60 days, a couple of months. And then they're on their own, okay? But what's interesting is that after the, the winter months or whatever, when spring rolls around, they come back to the same place where they were hatched. And they have more ducklings. Now, what was so interesting about that is that it takes one to make one. And as we are discipling others, and they're coming out of their lifestyles or whatever it is they're a part of, once they've accepted Christ, it's so easy for them to go back in and grab somebody and disciple them to bring them out, and then that person would go back in and go back to where they came from, grab somebody, bring them out, because see, it takes one to make one. So the little ducklings that was following their mama, they go back to the same place and, and have some more little ducklings that's following them. Amen. Yes. So let's go to our last and final point. Discipleship results in disciples making disciples. Discipleship results. In disciples making disciples. Verses 8 through 10. It says, the Lord's message rang out from you. This is still Paul talking to the Thessalonians. The Lord's message rang out from you. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. 
They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Discipleship results in disciples making disciples. And so Paul's reminding them that the Lord's message or, or the word of the Lord rang out from them. The subject and the object of our focus as disciples is the Lord's message, right? It doesn't matter who is delivering the message. The point is that the message is being delivered. If we do a grammatical study on this sentence, what we will see is it was given in the passive voice. So it doesn't matter who is, what matters is that The message rang out. The Lord's message. That word, that phrase rang out. In another translation, it sounded forth. It's from a Greek word that is a compound word, X, E, X, and echo, E, C, H, O, X, echo. So it appears that the Thessalonians became a sounding board from which the gospel echoed out from where they were, from where they were in Macedonia, echoed out to Achaia, and then it says to everywhere. So they got the message out. You see, in Acts 1 and 8, it says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Macedonia, And you will be my witnesses in all Judea and Samaria, Achaia, and to the end of the earth, everywhere. And so this church is following the call on their lives by sending out the message. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has become known And so here's what those people said about them, about the Thessalonians. Here's what they said. They said, you turned to God from idols. So that was interesting, the word order, to God from idols. Because it's interesting because here's what we do. We want to try to get straight before we give our lives to God, right? We want to stop. I'm going to stop smoking weed and I'm going to church. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to stop doing this or that. And, and, And what the Thessalonians disciples observed was they turned to God first. You turn to God and then he'll take you from those idols. Amen. He'll turn things around in your life. And so it said that they said that you turn to God and from idols and then now you serve the living and the true God. And so restoration. We're not getting this series for for no reason. I believe God is calling us. He wants to send us out from this building. There's a there's a neighborhood across the street. There's basketball court, there's schools, there's people at our jobs, there's people in our homes. Disciples, making disciples is what God is calling us to. You see, the Thessalonian disciples, I don't believe that they stood on a mountaintop and they shouted out the Lord's message for all the world to hear. I believe they walked the talk. I believe they imitated Paul. I believe they imitated Christ. I believe that they denied their self. I believe that they took up their cross. I believe that they followed Jesus. And I believe that they sat at his feet. I believe that they learned of him. And I believe that their faith became known everywhere by the way they acted. So it takes one to make one, but we have to get out and change our behavior because remember, 
we imitate Christ, but as we're imitating him, we're getting our stamp and we're becoming an example or a model of the faith to others. And then we're discipling them and the same thing is happening and the circle is getting bigger and bigger and wider. Come on, worship team. So here's my challenge. I gave the challenge to the first service. I'm going to give it to the second service. Get a disciple. Be a disciple. Get somebody to disciple. One person. One person. And I don't mean be, just be nice to them when you see them in the lunchroom or say hi. I mean live life. Pray about it. Think about it. One person. Now, it's going to do something to you because behaviors have to change. If you want to look like Christ, yeah, he's going to cause a shift, a transformation in our lives so that we can impact the world. So you choose one person and you pour your life, your time, you invite them to your house, you go to their house, you do things with them, you call them on the phone, you spend time regularly and consistently and watch what happens. They're going to grab somebody else and begin to do the same thing because it takes one to make one. And before you know it, we're going to have Aurora and Denver and Colorado. And then the world will know of Christ and they'll say, they'll say about restoration that I saw what you did and I know that God turns you from your idols. Hallelujah. So let's stand to our feet.